Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, does the World War II era highly radioactive waste illegally buried in the Waste Lake landfill in North St. Louis violate the human rights of those who live in the area of North St. Louis? That's the question we'll be examining this week as we follow the continuing saga of Just Mom's STL as they appeal to the United Nation to try to obtain satisfaction, remediation, and relocation for those facing those health-compromising dangers. Just Mom Dawn Chapman takes us inside the U.N. meeting that began the process to determine if, if this is a human rights case and if the United Nations is capable of helping them. Plus, you will hear our ever-popular Numbnuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck and Cover Report, and more honest nuclear information than Canadians are currently getting about the radiological angle on what's happening with the Fort McMurray fire. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, May 10, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting out this week in Canada, where we send love and light to the people whose lives have been so deeply impacted by the wildfire, the massive wildfire at Fort McMurray. What is just being revealed now is the nuclear impact of this fire as well. It turns out that 43,000 cubic meters, which is one and a half million cubic feet of bulky radioactive waste, is stored near Fort McMurray. This radium-contaminated waste includes contaminated soil and sediment, along with docks and building material from the northern transportation route. This is the route that used to carry radium ore and concentrates from the Port Radium Mine on the eastern arm of Great Bear Lake to the refinery in Port Hope, Ontario, between 1931 and 1940. Then, after nuclear fission was discovered and the A-bomb program began, what was carried along that route from 1944 onwards was uranium concentrates. The radioactive war and our concentrates were carried by the Satu Dene native men on their backs in burlap sacks and loaded onto a boat that took about eight hours to cross the lake to a river near the present-day site of Deline. The ore carriers would often lie on the sacks as the boat crossed the lake. Then they would carry the sacks off the boat and onto a river barge, where the cargo would be carried south to the railhead near the present-day site of Fort McMurray. From there, it would either be flown or sent by rail to Port Hope. The burlap bag sometimes ripped or tore open, showering the ore carriers with radium-bearing material that they were never told could be dangerous, there were no facilities for showering or changing clothes, nor any instructions for the workers to wash thoroughly, to remove the radioactive materials from their skin and hair. As a result, they unknowingly carried radioactive materials back home in an unwanted care package to family, children, and friends. If any of the Fort McMurray fire hit the radioactive materials and incinerated them, the radiation would again be airborne and spread by the wind, by the rain, into people's lungs and on their skin and on their property, into the plants, into the animals. That's the thing about nuclear. It is the gift that nobody wants that keeps on giving and giving. If you are impacted by this fire directly, if you can smell the smoke, if you are anywhere in that area, and have radiation monitoring equipment, please use it and let us know here at Nuclear Hot Seat what your findings are. Moving south over the border into the United States, 
EPA data reveals a sharp spike in radiation level around the Hanford nuclear site in southeastern Washington state. An unprecedented number of workers at Hanford have been exposed to dangerous chemical vapors since Thursday, April 28. We reported on this story last week, but now a total of 47 people have sought medical attention after being exposed to dangerous chemical vapors. Symptoms reported by the workers include headache, burning nose and throat, nausea, and one of the key elements if one is exposed to radiation, a metallic taste in the mouth, as well as elevated blood pressure and dizziness. We're working on gathering some interviews on the Hanford situation for Nuclear Hot Seat and hope to have that story for you next week. Now it's time for the nuclear reactor duck (coughs) and cover report where we look at what's going wrong with reactors around the country, and boy, is it a doozy this week. Damaged bolts were found inside a New Jersey nuclear reactor core, which prompted new inspections and, guess what, repairs. What is being called degradation to about 2% of the bolts that secure a metal liner inside the core of the Salem 1 nuclear reactor has caused its operator to extend the plant's current shutdown for additional inspections and repairs. Salem 1 was taken offline on April 15 for what was expected to be a routine refueling outage. It was during a visual inspection of the reactor core that issues with a number of the bolts was discovered. What's being termed degradation was found on 18 of the 832 baffle bolts inside the reactor core. The utility declined to elaborate, but Nuclear Regulatory Commission spokesmodel Neil Sheehan said that the degradation on the bolts was cracking. Some of the bolt heads had actually broken off, and a number of them have been recovered from the reactor core. Yet, Sheehan said, there was no imminent danger of these bolts failing. Two things. First of all, it sounds like they had already failed. And imminent is one of those nuclear industry wiggle words to say, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Well, we're paying attention. <coughs> the NRC has called for a reevaluation of data regarding the Indian Point nuclear reactors, only 24 miles from New York City, and is calling for its staff to reevaluate aspects of severe accident mitigation analysis. This is an essential aspect of facility owner-operator Entergy's attempts to renew the operating license of the nuclear plant for another 20 years. The NRC commissioner's decision was made only after the state of New York petitioned for the review of a partial decision by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, made in 2013, on the grounds that Entergy's severe accident mitigation alternatives for Indian Point Units 2 and 3 did not accurately reflect decontamination and cleanup costs associated with a severe accident at the plant. In other words, the NRC finally admits that Indian Point is not as safe as they told us. (coughs) In Miami, Florida, a study has confirmed that Florida Power and Light's nuclear plant canals are leaking radioactive tritium into Biscayne Bay. According to a study released Monday by Miami-Dade County Mayor Carlos Jimenez, water sampling in December and January found tritium levels up to 215 times higher than normal in ocean water. Tritium is typically monitored as a tracer of nuclear power plant leaks or spills. A recent sampling of water in Biscayne Bay found higher than normal levels of tritium. This study comes two weeks after a Tallahassee judge ordered the utility and the state to clean up the nuclear power plant's cooling canals after concluding that they had caused a massive underground saltwater plume to migrate west, threatening a well field that supplies drinking water to the Florida Keys. It also confirms suspicions that Turkey Point's aging canals are leaking into the nearby National Park. (coughs) And in an action that 
almost qualifies as numbnuts of the week. Not quite, but almost. In northern Illinois, in Will County, both the Braidwood and the Dresden nuclear reactor sites on May 7th experienced what is being labeled the inadvertent actuation of all 27 full-sounding sirens. That's 27 each, or 54 in total. This does qualify for the nuclear adrenal hit of the week for anyone who knew what those sirens represented. Fortunately, it was a false alarm, courtesy owner-operator Exelon Corporation's emergency preparedness. And that's this week's Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear Reactor Duck <coughs> and Cover Report. It's not only a matter of the physical security of the reactors, there are also the financial and legal shenanigans around them, even when they're closed. The California Public Utilities Commission announced on Monday, May 9th, that it is reopening the case involving the shutdown of the San Onofre nuclear power plant, which was closed in 2013. The CPUC said that it is reevaluating the settlement agreement that left ratepayers on the hook for $3.3 billion of the cost of closing the facility based on the incompetence of design and unapproved design changes in the steam generators of the facility that were geared to ramping it up to create even more electricity, meaning even more money, for owner-operator Southern California Edison. The commission is giving the parties involved in the case the opportunity to comment on whether the agreement was reasonable, given that representatives of San Onofre's primary owner, Southern California Edison, engaged in secret talks with regulators over the closed nuclear plant. They were not only in secret, they were held in Poland. Michael Aguirre, a San Diego lawyer who has criticized the settlement as unjust, said, This is really a remarkable development. The cost of closing the power plant really should have been borne by the investors. The ruling follows a $16.7 million fine in December against Edison for failing to disclose the talks. And now, let's all shed a crocodile tear or two for poor widow Exelon Corporation. It's continuing to stamp its poor widow feet and hold a little tantrum because it said it would close two nuclear power plants in Illinois if the great big state officials don't pass legislation that provides funding and support for nuclear. Yeah, that's right. The kid wants its allowance, even though it never bothered to clean up its room and has no plans to do so for the next mm, 480,000 years. But Exelon said that it would close its Clinton, Illinois nuclear power plant and its Quad Cities nuclear power plant based near Cordova if Illinois doesn't pass, quote-unquote, adequate legislation by the end of the month. What a crybaby corporation. Just suck it up and shut them down. Which leads me to... Nuclear Hot Seed Nuclear Hot Seed Nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. In a direct affront to the 47-year-old activist group, San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace, which has been fighting against Diablo Canyon's nuclear reactors for all that time, there's a new group that's been formed called Mothers for Nuclear. And who are the mothers? Both just happen to work at Diablo Canyon. Heather Madison and Kristen Zaitz, who have obviously been well coached in their talking points by members of the nuclear industry, are using motherhood and global warning to change the way Californians feel about nuclear power, warning that they must do so before it's too late. Both worry that the seaside plant could soon close if environmentalists and some state officials get their way, they neglect to mention that the area is surrounded by earthquake faults, and if an attempt was made to survey the area and build it these days, it would not pass 
environmental impact standards because the earthquake faults are so close and are so deep. What makes this so ironic, and I swear I'm not quoting the onion here, is that Kristen Zeitz has a job that involves studying how well the facility and its equipment can withstand earthquakes, which shows that maybe they're not paying attention to the facts. And in some truly twisted logic, Heather Madison says that one of the reasons that they are creating this group is, quote, if it's coming from the utility, it's not quite as credible as if it's coming from two moms. Two moms who happen to work for the utility. I can understand if someone is motivated to fight to save their job. But how about saving lives? Saving the future? And how dare you co-opt the concept of mothers and what they stand for in alignment with life to put yourself in alignment with death as represented by nuclear? While they say the company has not contributed funding to Mothers for Peace, they don't mention whether they've had time off, coaching by PR experts, or had access to maybe some help out of their PR department, which got them this hefty article in the San Francisco Chronicle. And in an unveiled threat at the end of the article, Madison said, If Diablo closes and we both lose our jobs, then maybe we'll go become full-time nuclear activists and make sure this doesn't happen elsewhere. And just who might be funding that particular endeavor if push comes to shove. And that is why Judas Goats, Heather Madison, and Christian Zeitz, you have the honor of becoming this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. An important article on nuclear plant containment failures and pre-existing damage by David Lockbaum, who is the director of the Nuclear Safety Project for the Union of Concerned Scientists. It's just been published, and it's called Disaster by Design. Lockbaum writes, The surest way for a containment to be damaged after an accident and be unable to fulfill this safety function is for it to be damaged before the accident starts. And he goes on to write that some of the actual events at U.S. nuclear power plants that resulted in pre-existing containment problems existed for some time while the reactors operated before the problems were finally detected and corrected. We'll have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 255. Over to Japan where a shocking report in a weekly magazine called Josei Jishin reports that under the guidance of NPOs specialized in environmental and radiation issues, the magazine has measured cesium-137 in soil at 60 places picked at random among primary and middle schools in Fukushima Prefecture. The results were beyond expectation. In about 80% of the 60 samples, the cesium-137 reached more than 40,000 becquerels per cubic meter, which is the level to be designated as radiation-controlled area. A radiation-controlled area is an area outside of a restricted area, but inside site boundaries at a nuclear facility, access to which can be limited by the licensee for any reason. Further, Individuals 18 years old and younger are not allowed to work in these areas, and adults are not allowed to work for more than 10 hours. Neither eating nor drinking is allowed. And remember, this was found near primary and middle schools in Fukushima Prefecture. Some of the measurements were incredibly high. Near Nihonmatsu Daini Middle School in Nihonmatsu City, Cesium-137 was measured at 1.08 million becquerels per cubic meter, which would be subject to second-degree relocation if it were in Belarus after the nuclear accident in Chernobyl. In a second-degree relocation, the area is ordered to relocate and stop using the land for agriculture. Remember, Japan is claiming that for the 2020 Tokyo No Olympics, 
They are not only going to be having events scheduled in Fukushima Prefecture, but they are going to put a focus on feeding the athletes and fans with locally produced food. At Wada Primary School in Motomiya City, cesium-137 showed 665,000 becquerels per square meter and 1,000 becquerels per square meter at Riazan Middle School in Date City. Both could be subject to second-degree relocation in the Chernobyl scale as well. At Nuclear Hot Seat, we feel that the government of Japan is both criminal and criminally insane to not only be allowing people to move back into this area, but to be planning to take away the stipends given to the people who were forced out by the nuclear disaster, which in effect forces them to return to this highly radioactive area. On Monday, a group of Japanese former fishermen filed an unprecedented lawsuit seeking compensation from the government for failing to disclose for decades records of their exposure to radiation from U.S. hydrogen bomb tests in the Pacific Ocean in 1954. A total of 45 people, mostly from Kochi Prefecture and including families of deceased fishermen, are seeking 2 million yen each, which may sound like a lot, but is actually only a little under $18,500 per person. But this is the first time a compensation lawsuit has been filed against the state in connection with the hydrogen bomb test conducted on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The test began with an explosion code named Castle Bravo on March 1st of 1954, which was the largest nuclear weapons test ever conducted by the United States. Many of those who are suing are the families of fishermen and crew members who died while still in their 40s. This little bit of good news. Shikoku Electric Power Company on Tuesday ended operation of a nearly 40-year-old nuclear reactor in western Japan, making it the sixth unit to be scrapped forever under stricter safety regulations introduced after the 2011 Fukushima disaster began. The utility decided in March to decommission the idled number one reactor at its Ikata nuclear complex in Ahimi Prefecture, as it would be too costly to reboot the aging reactor. It is expected to take about 30 years to complete the decommissioning of the reactor at a total cost of 40 billion yen, according to the company. Remember, that's 30 years to decommission an intact nuclear reactor. So when the government of Japan tries to convince us that it will only take 40 years to quote-unquote decommission the total disaster scene of Fukushima, we know exactly which end of their body that information is coming out of, and it's not their mouth. France's nuclear giant, Arriva, faced a major scandal beginning on Tuesday after the country's nuclear watchdog confirmed that there have been what they are calling irregularities in 400 parts produced in its reactor since 1965 and that around 50 are currently in service in France's nuclear power plant fleet. France's Independent Nuclear Safety Authority, or ASN, said that the irregularities were listed in an audit it had ordered from Arriva after the watchdog group detected a very serious anomaly, their words, in a reactor vessel in the country's Flamanville nuclear plant. This is the same model nuclear reactor that Britain plans to use for its two new facilities at Hinkley Point. The fault in the vessel destined to house the plant's nuclear fuel and confine its radioactivity. A little bit important, don't you think? The fault was detected last year. ASN said in a statement, these irregularities consist of incoherencies, modifications, or omissions in manufacturing dossiers. Shades of Southern California Edison and the San Onofre steam generators. These guys all seem to get their marching orders from the exact same playbook. Doubts over the document supposed to rubber stamp the quality of parts destined for new generation nuclear power reactors 
will be a cause for serious concern for the British government, as it is poised to finalize a controversial multi-billion pound contract for Arriva to build reactors at Hinkley Point. And finally, this story of a poignant art project out of Sweden. Artist Leonard Grebelius has created Letter to My Dear, to bring the question of our moral responsibility to future generations to the fore. He points out that nuclear waste has to be stored for 100,000 years before it becomes safe for people, animals, and nature itself. 100 years corresponds to 3,000 generations. Grebelius said, The time perspective is dizzying. And our responsibility for what we do today becomes so very obvious when you make it concrete. Do we really have the right to demand that the citizens of the future shall guard our radioactive rubbish? The core of the work is a letter to a child of a future generation. He or she should only be willing to forgive us. We'll have today's featured interview in just a moment, but first... Nuclear Hot Seat is listener-supported and relies on your donations to help keep us active. If you can help us meet these goals, no amount is too small. So please, do what you can. One thing I like to suggest to people is to buy us a cup of metaphorical coffee. In other words, what you would spend for a cup of Starbucks, instead, skip the cup, send it to us. I promise you I won't buy a cup of coffee with it but it will go to the monthly operating costs for this program. It's easy to do. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, and right there you will see a big red Donate button. Click on it, follow the prompts, you'll know what to do. And know from me that whatever amount you can offer is crucial to us keeping going and touches us deeply here, and we thank you. When attempting to get justice, when one's life has been disrupted by nuclear contamination and other abuses of the industry, you knock on every door you can. And when one doesn't open or proves to have no effect, you move on to the next and the next and the next. That's what's been happening for Dawn Chapman and Karen Nickel of Just Moms STL who are also the admins of the Westlake Landfill Facebook page. They just returned from another whirlwind trip, this time to New York City, where they met with representatives of the UN Human Rights Commission. This is the branch of the UN that accepts human rights complaints after domestic remedies have been exhausted, unless it appears that such remedies would be ineffective or unreasonably prolonged. Well, ineffective and unreasonably prolonged are excellent descriptions of the way the U.S. government, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the long-thwarted Army Corps of Engineers has been dealing or not dealing with the Westlake issue. Our government has been throwing lip service at it, but not taking active steps to immediately address the dangers of an underground fire that is now within 500 yards of 43,000 tons of illegally buried, highly radioactive World War II weapons waste. That's what's sitting illegally in an unlined trench in the Westlake Landfill Superfund site, which is in the middle of their cancer-riddled neighborhood. Dawn Chapman provides this inside look at the process that got her and Karen Nickel into the UN, along with Lois Gibbs, founder of the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. Dawn Chapman, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks for having me back again, Lady. You and Karen Nickel recently returned from a whirlwind trip to New York City, where you met at the United Nations with some representatives of that body. First of all, tell us what led you to seek out the UN and what did you hope to accomplish with a meeting there? We approached the UN probably starting this fall when we realized fairly quickly, especially after um, the report from the Attorney General came out saying how close the fire was to the waste, that nothing was happening. We were pushing we had gotten some legislation introduced, but nothing was really happening. And the thing with the United Nations is 
they're very hesitant to get involved with anything until you've exhausted all efforts. You know, they don't want to jump in in the middle of something with already things going on to fix it. This past December, we held a tribunal. There was a man from the United Nations by the name of John Knox. He's in Geneva, and he's in with the human rights. You can basically appeal to the United Nations if you feel like your rights are being violated. You can host a tribunal. There has to be a panel, and you have to go out and find people to sit on the panel, and they have to fulfill so many different roles within the community and within the area that they're in. They have to be very outspoken, very involved, not in your cause, but just overall in the community. So we did that, and we had about, I think, 12 people go and testify to how they felt like this landfill was impacting their lives. We have workers, we had residents, we had children. We tried to cover all the bases so that everybody was represented. We were going to go to New York anyway and drop that off at the United Nations. In other words, what you were going to drop off was the report from this tribunal. Right, and we had uh, videoed it, so we were going to drop off the video and, and the report and just say, hey, thank you, please consider looking at this, and walk out. Was Lois Gibbs involved yet in this? Was she the one who told you about this program? She is the one who had a contact. John Knox is somebody that she has worked with at the UN before. Lois Gibbs got us in contact with John Knox. She found out about the tribunal process through him, and we had been discussing it for a couple of months. Was that a good option to do? By the time December rolled around, we'd had an evacuation plan come out and be released. We'd had legislation introduced that hadn't gone anywhere. So we felt like that was an okay time. And we also felt like once we did the tribunal and taped it, we could wait for a, a couple of months and see if there was any additional movement. And, you know, we could, and in your estimation, was there any additional movement? We were able to go to Washington, D.C. We were able to meet with Gina McCarthy and meet with the Council on Environmental Quality arm of the White House. So we thought, okay, this is all happening Again, you know, the United Nations, they don't like to get involved until you've exhausted everything. So we did the meetings with the White House and with Gina McCarthy, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we heard no response. You know, we called both, and still no response. And so we decided that it was a good time to go. We actually thought that we would just go and drop it off, but we thought since we met with both of those two, we would reach out to the UN to see if we qualified basically for a meeting, if they thought that, you know, we had exhausted all our efforts. And we didn't get confirmation that we were actually going to have a meeting until the end of the week before we were going to New York. So it was like maybe I think that Wednesday or Thursday, and then I left on Monday, Karen left on Saturday. What do you do to prepare for the actual physical meeting? I know that you in D.C. stayed with Lois Gibbs, famous for her involvement in Love Canal and her success there. What, if anything, did you do to prepare the way you did for the meetings down in D.C.? You know, every meeting we go to <laughs> gets more and more stressful, and there's more and more on the line. This one was very, very nerve-wracking because we wanted to get everything right. And because we had such a limited amount of time to get everything in, so we tried to get it down to sound bites and pick out the most important documents. At 11 o'clock at night, the night before the meeting, we were in New York talking about, you know, the heartbreaking stories from our people here. And we decided to take a quick trip down to Ground Zero, where the World Trade Center was. We just thought, for whatever reason, we needed to go down there. What was the impact of going down to ground zero from the position of you're going to the U.N. to stand up for your rights and for the rights of your community and the safety of your community the next day? When we were standing outside of ground zero, we couldn't get close to the reflection pools because they were closed. It was very late at night, and there were still a lot of people out on the street. But, you know... They actually, they have the names of every single person whose life was lost. 
every single person whose life was lost in that building is named. And it just was such a, you know, I was looking, I couldn't get close, but I could see flowers sticking in where some of those names were. Then it became, if you counted all the names, and then you counted all the flowers, the flowers, they didn't represent to me the people that had died. They represented the people that were left alive and that were scarred from it. Mm. And so suddenly, even though there weren't any names attached to the flowers of who actually put the flower there, it multiplied the number of people that had been hurt. I thought, my goodness, for every name on here, think of how many people knew that one person whose name is there. And I just thought every single one of those people, it's like dominoes, isn't it? It's like a chain reaction. And I just thought, we have so many people hurting, so much at stake with this meeting. And I just, honestly, it it was a good reminder of why we were there and that we have the opportunity in front of us to prevent something bad from happening. And we have to take that. I mean, every single name counts. Every person here counts. If we can save just one person, that matters. And so, I mean, it really kind of recharged us, and we were kind of on a mission on our way back. We're like, all right, we got to do this. We have to nail this. We have to make them understand. So on Tuesday, May 3rd in the afternoon, you had your meeting with the United Nations. What was it like going in there? It was so intimidating. It's such a beautiful area, and I could see all the flags. And we weren't sure, like, which entrance to go in. And there was so much pressure to get it right. I mean, we kept checking our phones and going through our phones and looking at pictures of our friends. Like, you know, looking at Mary Osco and looking at my friend Kristen Camuso, you know, trying to think about them and think about what they've been through and how this has impacted them. And keeping this about people, those are people, those are their lives, and they count. We wanted it to be about them and not about numbers and statistics and dots. You know, these are real people that are being impacted, and we know these people. But as we're standing there, I the saddest thing to me is that I remember seeing the flags. We were, we were on such a mission and so focused. This might have been the most focused we've been in on any meeting that I don't remember what the actual building looked like. When you got into the meeting... Give us a sense of what was going on, where you were, and who you were meeting with. When we got to the United Nations, once we walked inside, our hearts kind of sank for a second because, again, we were trying to be so focused, but the security. We had to have new name badges made, I mean, and photos taken. It was pretty intense just to get into the building and past the lobby and it was so hard for us. We were trying to remain focused. And thankfully, this lovely woman introduced herself as the chair of the meeting. And she was in the human rights division. And we knew that we only had about half an hour, 45 minutes. Our goal was to paint the story and everything that was happening and how people's rights were being infringed and make them understand that we have tried everything we can. We've worked our way up the ladder. That's a lot to do in half an hour and 45 minutes. So Karen and I had it down. We were on the cab right there practicing with her husband, Todd, role-playing in the back of the cab. They took us, and we went up an elevator, and it was kind of disorienting. It's a very humble environment. It's cubicles. You can tell it's the UN. You, the symbol is everywhere. But they walked us into a conference room. And how many people were you meeting with in addition to this woman from the Human Rights Division? We were only supposed to meet with one person that we knew of, and then another person came in. She had broken away from a meeting to attend this one with us. She had looked over some things in advance. And I think she was just so interested about the situation and learning more about it. That ended up being just amazing having the two of them there because then there were two people we could look at and watch their body language. And, of course, they were playing off of each other as well as we were talking. The women you met with, were they from the United States or what countries were they from? No, the one was from France and the one I think was from Sri Lanka. I think that that had an incredible impact. 
we were talking to people about what has been allowed to happen in our country, that our government has allowed to happen to people who are part of the UN who live in the country but are not from this country. And they never said anything bad about this country. It wasn't like that. It was just a feeling that not only are you educating someone who maybe when they call a relative, maybe they'll say, hey, you won't believe what I heard. But there was just such empathy and compassion in them. You couldn't have picked better people for the role, right, down to the table being round. I I, I actually thought it would be difficult to have this discussion at a very long rectangle conference table. I actually thought about that. I mean, everything just went the way it was supposed to go. It felt like when we started out and we started explaining what was happening at the site, what had been done, how we became involved, it was like they were thirsty for more. And I know that sounds silly, but they just, they were so thirsty for more information. We had practiced condensing it, and it turns out that, I think they had figured out that's what we were doing. They wanted the long version. That's extraordinary. So you were taken very seriously. You were listened to, and they wanted more information. How long did you go, and how was the meeting left? We ended up going for about, I want to say it was maybe an hour and a half. I mean, they just wanted more, more, more. And to give you an example, I brought the evacuation plan that was just released this past fall, and I had highlighted some sections in it. Boy, they really wanted to look over almost all of it. I mean, they were, and they were looking at each other like, oh, my God. I mean, you're laying a plan in front of the U.N. that states what it could look like if this fire hits the waste and what the response is going to be and how complicated. And, you know, it says a catastrophic event in there. It talks about particles being released over the entire St. Louis region. They understood. And at one point... She was holding the plan, and she closed it and put her hand on top of it and looked at all of us around the table, and she said, this is just what they're going to do if something happens, when something happens. And we were like, yes. And she said, this doesn't talk about how to prevent something from happening. Exactly. And that was it. That was it. That moment, I thought, bingo, we've got them. We've got them. So – what would be capable of happening through the United Nations as a result of this meeting? The ball is rolling in what direction? How far can this go? Well, I mean, it can go very far. We were hoping that we would find an area that we qualify for. It turns out that we have quite a few options within the U.N. You know, when you talk about people's rights being violated, there's so many different ways that happen. Children deprived of education, housing, toxins and environmental there's so many different things that we qualify for in this situation it's going to be trying to figure out which one we're more comfortable with and that best fits our situation and then from that point we will be assigned to a peripheral or you know a specific area of human rights and then from that point begins the process of what can they do what can we do They have the ability to put a lot of pressure. She actually handed us, one of the women, a press release that the U.N. had done for the residents of Flint, urging President Obama and talking about, you know, the drinking water standards and how these people have been without water for how many years now. You know, that carries a lot of weight. Once that came out, that's pretty much when Obama decided to go and visit Flint. So, in other words, there's tremendous power of, exposure of the weaknesses or the feebleness of the response so far and almost a shaming of those who have not responded into taking action. Would that be accurate? Absolutely. And, you know, there's obviously media attention when that happens. They cannot do anything legislative. They don't have that kind of authority. It's more of a pressure. And while I think to some people – That might not feel like enough. I can't stress the feeling you get when you walk in this building. You know, we walk around, we get on social media, and we're surrounded by bad guys, corporations, politicians that are taking money from corporations, you know, all this stuff going on, EPA trying to finagle behind the scenes. 
walking into this building and meeting these people, these are some of the kindest, most genuine people who really care. And it didn't fall on deaf ears. That alone, there was such comfort and hope when we left the meeting. You know, at one point, one of the ladies reached out and said, I am just so sorry. I am just so sorry for what you guys are having to go through. And there was a sense of urgency at the end of the meeting. There were some key people that were in town for a meeting, and they wanted to see if we could stay an extra day so that they could set up meetings right away. I know you weren't able to stay because of certain familial responsibilities that you have. Are those meetings still a possibility in the near future? They are. They are absolutely a possibility. We actually probably need to touch base with the UN this week sometime and see when we can schedule those meetings. But, yes, that really surprised us. Karen and I looked at each other. Even though we knew we couldn't stay, the fact that they understood the urgency of our situation and they were like, okay, let's go, let's go now, that was pretty incredible. I understand that the simple fact of this meeting has already yielded one unexpected, but in retrospect, pretty predictable outcome as regards the EPA. Could you tell us what has happened most recently in the wake of this meeting? In regards to the aftermath of this meeting and some of the pressure that even just getting a chance to meet with the UN has brought, we have a phone conference set up with Gina McCarthy administrator of the EPA next week. We haven't heard from her. You know, we've been trying to schedule a conference call and just hadn't heard back. We've sent emails, made phone calls. And this is in the wake of you actually having had a meeting with her down in D.C. where she said, oh, yes, we have to follow up. We have to do something about this. And she said she would get back to you in two weeks, which obviously she did not do on her own recognizance. That's correct. We set a two-week limit, and she said, you know, we need to keep in touch and that she would get back to us, and we heard nothing. And before we left for New York, we did leave messages. We did reach out personally and speak with her secretary, who assured us that he would print her email and walk it there. So we did try, and we did hear back from her when we got home from the U.N. New York trip. So then we do have a conference call next week. So it seems that Gina, who I refer to as Gina never met a nuke I didn't like in cover for McCarthy, does respond if there is a big stick being waved in her direction. In the first case, it was the White House. Now it's the United Nations. At least you're getting some response from her. That's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So given that you had this one meeting and you have achieved what i believe is always the goal of any activist or activist group that meets with people in a position of power and that is always know where and when your next meeting is going to take place it sounds like there are going to be ongoing meetings with the united nations what do you hope to accomplish or what are they capable of bringing to the table beyond what they already have They have the ability to put pressure. They have the ability to hold hearings. They can do their own tribunals. The other thing is they have the ability to help network. It can be, I think you know a little something about this, it can be lonely as an activist group. It can be lonely when you're dealing with an issue, but they have contact with so many people who are dealing with so many issues. And really in regards to the EPA, some of the Flint residents and moms. There's a whole group of moms up there that are dealing with Gina McCarthy and EPA, and it's a different location. It's a different poison, but it's the same broken bureaucracy. And the other way that the United Nations can put pressure is on individual politicians. With the backing of the UN, and if the UN puts out a press release, a lot of these politicians that have stayed on the sidelines It's kind of the backing and the blessing they need to jump in. And we really need some champions here. We really do. You know, on this issue, on the North County issues, and, you know, it's my hope that the U.N. can help with that quite a bit. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That's actually a perfect voice to have in the background. Don't be sorry. You're doing it for the kids. So there's just been a guest appearance by one of your kids on the show in the interview. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, Dawn, we will keep following this story, and thank you so much for your generosity of time and spirit, not only in the work that you're doing, but in your willingness to share it with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby, for having me again. That was Dawn Chapman of Just Moms STL, who, along with Karen Nickel, is an admin for the Facebook Westlake Landfill page. We will, of course, keep covering this story for you, the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. While several of its agencies, most notably World Health Organization and the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCIR, have been known to distort and or misrepresent findings on the impact of the nuclear disasters at Chernobyl and Fukushima, in this instance, they may provide a means of, if not remediation, at least international pressure and awareness to get the U.S. to get off of its duff and actually work to get the fire and the landfill under control while doing right by the people of North St. Louis. Activist shout-out! Thanks to Rachel Clark for translating the article on radiation found in soil at primary and middle schools in Fukushima Prefecture. That article alone could give tremendous pause to anyone actually thinking of attending the 2020 Tokyo No Olympics and to have them canceling any reservations they may have made already for a flight or a place to stay. Further thanks to Molly Lightfoot, for making Rachel's translation available on Facebook. Here's today's final thought. The therapeutic definition of trauma is disruption without repair. This definition is used by psychiatrists and psychological professionals to refer to cases of physical and sexual abuse, as well as any overwhelming emotional event which throws a person out of their normal life patterns. Trauma is the result of a perpetrator or perpetrational experience that remains raw, exposed, and an unremediated source of pain. If that's not a definition of what nuclear does to people and the environment, I don't know what is. We have all been traumatized by the nuclear industry. I believe from the start that nuclear is a perpetrational technology. It takes and takes and takes out of all proportion to what it appears to give. It injures indiscriminately, denies responsibility for its actions, and tries to blame and belittle the victims while maintaining that their technology does no damage, only good. And what are you talking about that you're accusing it of something other than that? The nuclear industry and its political and governmental agency allies work together to lie, cheat, intimidate, bully, and then hide the long-term damage it does while denying that nuclear does any damage at all. Yet this is the technology that assaults life on Earth in such a way that, on its own, the disruption will continue to be a threat for almost half a million years, based on how long it will take weapons-grade plutonium to go flat. And let's face it, nuclear never, ever, attempts to repair the disruption they have created. Indeed, because of this, we don't even know if meaningful repair is possible. In recovery from childhood abuse issues, individuals first need to share their truth with support of others, most usually therapists and 12-step groups. At some point, Many of these people decide that it's time to confront their perpetrators, name the crimes that were done to them, and hold those who committed them accountable. They must do so with absolutely no expectation that the perp will suddenly crumble, admit their guilt, and beg forgiveness. It almost never happens. But what this taking action does is empower the victim to be able to claim the term survivor instead of victim, and move on. Get on with a life that is genuinely theirs. It's hard to get beyond the nuclear perpetrators because their dirty influence is smeared virtually everywhere in the world. 
from uranium mining and purification to the creation of fuel rods, the manufacture of weapons, the horrific legacy of the waste, and all the transport and storage that takes place along the way. Like many people who survived childhood abuse, most people are either ignorant of the damage nuclear creates or in denial about it. But some people have gotten beyond the victim responses of flight or freeze and moved into fight, the fight of activists against those perpetrators who think that they can keep doing this and getting away with it. Whether we know it or not, all of our lives have been disrupted by the trauma created by the many aspects of the nuclear problem. Now is the time for those of us who have moved into survivor and beyond that, into leadership and activism, to double down and keep pushing for that repair, no matter how long it takes. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 10, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Gordon Edwards, King 5 News in Seattle, and its ace reporter, Susanna Frame, rt.com, nj.com, riverkeeper.org, offgridquest.com, sananofresafety.org, and Donna Gilmore, latimes.com, allthingsnuclear.org, exelon.com, fltimes.com, sfgate.com, TheGuardian.com, JapanTimes.com, JapanToday.com, Telegraph.co.uk, The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, The Soulless Copywriting Hacks of World Nuclear News, and the terrific activists who gather on the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you are all invited to visit and like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, StuWebRadioNetwork.com, NewZSentinel.com, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, and now we've broken the broadcast barrier and our WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. First of many, and we're still looking for more. So if you know a community station or any other radio station that would like to carry this program, please connect us, put us in touch. We rely on you to help get us into places where we don't know that it's possible to go. Make certain you check out the archive we have of over 250 shows. They're on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and you can also find the show on iTunes. If you sign up on the website for the free chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, which is also available on Amazon, you will receive notice of Nuclear Hot Seat and a link to each week's show via email. And one more reminder that it's your contributions that help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate, verifiable nuclear news. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heart of Street Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now please, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.